Okay, resuming our discussion about complex gene regulation. Now in this slide we're going to see how the cell controls sugar metabolism. And in particular we're going to look how it uh, regulates the gene expression based on the presence of two sugars. Glucose, which is its preferred sugar case uh, source, or lactose. It like it will it can use lactose to grow, but it only likes to do so when no glucose is present because it's a less efficient sugar to be used. The genes we're going to turn on or off are the is the lac operon. Here we see the lac Z gene, plus there are about three other lac genes uh, at this operon. And we have two proteins that are going to be involved, a repressor and an activator which will bind depending on whether glucose or lactose are present. The, the repressor protein binds in response to lactose. The blue protein respond, binds in response to a molecule called cyclic AMP, which is related uh, to the glucose con uh, concentration. And, and, and again, the important point is you only want to turn on these lactose genes if lactose is present but glucose is absent. When lactose is your only source of possible source of energy, you want to make the lactose genes so you can take advantage of the presence of lactose. If glucose is present, making these lactose genes is a waste of time and energy. You will be much better off just using the glucose directly. So that's why it shuts them off when glucose is present. So I think it's best t to start with this case number two. Okay. That means glucose is present and there's no lactose in the environment. Then for sure no lactose is present. You want to make sure the lactose genes are um, not going to be made. And because there's no lactose present, there's this repressor protein who, wh whose normal state is to bind the DNA. Okay? It's normally repressing the lactose genes. Now in the situation when lactose gets added to the environment, just like in the trip repressor, the molecule lactose will bind to the repressor. It will cause a change in conformation, preventing it from binding to the DNA. Now the repressor is not able to bind, so the repressor will not stop the synthesis of the ge these genes but you still don't want to make them because you'd rather use glucose. So th the point is the default setting here is to not make the genes. Um, you don't have enough to get the, these genes started because you still don't want them because you have glucose present. Now the third case is there's no glucose and there's no lactose. Well you uh, can't use glucose because it's not there but you still don't want to make the lactose genes so these stay off since there's no lactose to bind to the repressor it's bound to the DNA which is its the repressor's normal state but now since there's no glucose uh, there's increased amounts of cyclic AMP cyclic AMP that's that red triangle right here uh, I'll circle it it binds to the cap protein which changes the conformation and it could this is a signal to say hey uh, we might need to use these genes because we don't have glucose, but the repressor is saying, but we don't have lactose anyway, so let's not bother. It's only in the, in the last case where there's no glucose, so you have high levels of cyclic AMP, so the cat protein is binding to the DNA, providing extra thermodynamic binding energy to help recruit the RNA polymerase to the promoter, and since there is lactose present, lactose is bound to the repressor, the repressor has fallen off, and now you can make the genes uh, that's going to help you metabolize lactose. So um, in this very simple way, using two proteins, one an activator, one a repressor, you can respond to a variety of environmental conditions uh, and make the proper choices on, on gene synthesis. Now most of what we've been talking with TRIP, the TRIP repressor and the lac operon have been um, for bacteria. In eukaryote, things are a little more complex, a little more regulated. The default setting for most of human genes is to do nothing. 
So in general, there's extra emphasis placed on activation. And in fact, uh, RNA polymerase 2, which is the RNA polymerase that makes messenger RNA in humans or eukaryotes, use generally multiple transcription factors to begin transcription. Even though we just saw examples where a single protein could help recruit the polymerase in eukaryotes, it's frequently the case that many proteins help recruit the RNA polymerase. Eukaryotic cells do not have operons. Each gene is regulated individually. The distances involved in regulation can be much larger. There can be uh, certainly many tens of thousands of bases between uh, transcription start site and these regulators bound in, and even hundreds of thousands of base pairs. And lastly, you might recall that we, when we were talking about chromosomes, there's things like euchromatin and heterochromatin. And in general, the uh, density of histone packing around genes provides another uh, level at which genes can be regulated. So in this slide, which is pretty general, this shows uh, a possible eukaryotic uh, gene. Here we have RNA polymerase, the TATA -ta binding protein, the, tra the general transcription factors, which we called TAFs, or tra transcription accessory factors. They've helped recruit the RNA polymerase to the promoter region, and it will transcribe this gene stopping. Here is the implication. Uh, right upstream, again, this is at the minus 10 and minus 35 spot. This could be this location where you have gene-specific Regulatory proteins or transcription factors this could be a few hundred bases from uh, the promoter. These sequences up here could also could be several thousand, and here we could have a protein that's uh, many tens of thousands of base pairs away. And in fact, they all the controlling proteins do not have to be upstream of the transcription start site. You can also have them down at the three prime end uh, below the gene where these again can help recruit the RNA polymerase to the promoter by DNA looping. On this slide we see a simple schematic of two activators being involved in promoting transcription at a promoter. And the idea of synergy, meaning that the effects of the two activators are greater than uh, simple addition. If this protein by itself will induce one unit of transcription and this, uh, unit, this protein can induce by itself two units of transcription. In this case, when both are present, uh, this, the book suggests there could be a hundred units of transcription. That's not always the case. The, the effects can be additive, but they can also be greater than additive. And, and th simple thermodynamics shows the mechanism Right, one kilocalorie difference of binding can be 70%, um, you know, favor an equilibrium by 70%. Two kilocalories gets you to 95%, and it can really start tipping the scales uh, by additional binding energy, in which case these activators are recruiting the polymerase to the promoter. For repression, there are many different uh, mechanisms. Uh, that how it could occur. We've seen how the trip repressor works and how the lac repressor works, meaning they bind DNA f and physically prevent the RNA polymerase from binding to that uh, promoter. Uh, your book lists about six different examples. I just I just put two here for for generality because basically anything that you can think of that can happen can happen. In this case. Um, the sequences on the DNA, which are bound by the activator and the repressor, overlap. So only one protein can bind at a time. If the repressor is present, perhaps it binds a little more strongly. The activator is not able to bind, and uh, it's not able then to activate transcription. Uh, a second example was masking the activation surface. Here they're both able to bind, but the repressor will occupy the activation domain so that the activation domain is not able to interact with the RNA polymerase sitting down here, which would normally transcribe the gene. And, and, and there are lots of other potential mechanisms. I just highlight these two. Because eukaryotic DNA is so uh, tightly packaged in chromatin with histone proteins, that and you can see here is a promoter site uh, right here at Tata -ta box and the challenge is how do you make that accessible f 
for uh, an RNA polymerase, well, this this slide shows two potential mechanisms. One is using a histone acetylase. The second is using a chromatin remodeling complex. We'll start with this. First is this gene activator protein binds to the chromatin remodeler, uh, which helps space histones in a, in a sort of different mace, sliding them around, uh, opening up this packaging such that the promoter is accessible for RNA polymerase. And uh, I'll just recall that when we talked about histones, we mentioned that it's pretty amazing, but the RNA polymerase can uh, transcribe genes while the histones are loosely associated. It doesn't let go of the histones while it's making it. But uh, this one method, the other one which I want you to think about is histone acetylase. Uh, can, this protein can help recruit an enzyme which puts acetyl groups on the histone tails, and that can also uh, activate transcription. And it's up to you to remember why you want to acetylate lysine residues uh, to help polymerase turn on these genes. If you think about our two basic rules, one of our two basic rules uh, for thermodynamic reasoning, the two rules being oil and water don't mix and like charges repel, po opposite charges attract, you should be able to conclude why this acetylation turns on genes. And continuing with the chromatin theme, uh, there are certain elements, in this case called a barrier sequence, and an insulator element, which are thought to be um, properties of the chromatin, which can influence the ability, in this case, the we're focusing on gene B being transcribed. Now heterochromatin, again, this is the densely packed dark material in chromosomes where genes are essentially turned off. Uh, here is a stretch of DNA which acts as a barrier sequence to prevent, uh, you can think of it as sort of a dam holding the waters of heterochrom heterochromatin back. Uh, so the location of heterochromatin is regulated by these barrier sequences and proteins which bind to them. If you would genetically manip go in and cut out this barrier sequence, you would find heterochromatin spreading into this region and th then gene B would, would be inactive. The second thing, when you put down an enhancer here, a protein that's binding the sequence specific effect, what happens, how do you know which gene can control? Is it going to control gene A, maybe being transcribed from right to left, or gene B? Again, since what it's providing is uh, thermodynamic binding energy to RNA polymerase, it could be affecting both of these genes equally. Well, there's an element here called an insulator element, which uh, in some way, and this is a case thought to be the way it's e either DNA is packaged or the confirmation it, that it uh, makes it a, um, adopt, that prevents an enhancer protein from binding here from assisting a polymerase to bind at this gene. So this enhancer, it, it might even be closer to gene A than gene B, but with this insulator element here, it's only going to affect gene B. And if you cut this insulator el element out genetically, uh, gene A might very well get turned on by an enhancer binding in this intervening region here. Okay, that concludes this video. We'll have one more video that talks about various kinds of genetic circuits for gene regulation. Thanks.